Good morning. Welcome to New Life. We're so glad you're here to worship with us. Would you stand and let's sing together?
Amen. You may be seated. What if I told you that today is the day? Regardless of how you got here, you'd leave with the right words to say. What if I told you that now you could take steps down a new path? Not the same old, same old. Moses led the Israelites, and Jonah took to the city, but what if I told you that we play the same itty-bitty part of the story of glory? God's plan A was to send his church, the body of Christ that was supposed to remember, but our fiery affections distract us and swipe right like tinder. Social media posts weren't supposed to replace genuine action. So what if I told you that there were far better ways of making substantial traction? Dense cities grow, and we know that if we go, love can do great things. So, another round of Halo? What if I told you that now is the time to get those kicks and get to step in and quit playing games with this holy profession? We're called, so we go. That's how it works. You pick up the cross and you follow the leader. It's easy, Jimmy, just watch the teacher. No special traits. It's not for the money, honey. The compensation of Christ is a debt that was paid. It's no walk in the shade. This path that we're on, it's hard and narrow and requires so much more than fancy wristbands and apparel. So what if today, friend, you find this groove? Well, then for you, my friend, it's time to move. Well, good morning. Welcome to New Life Christian Church. Uh, my name is Brett Andrews. I'm the senior minister here. And uh, if you're new this morning, we want to give you a special welcome, or if you're joining us online for the first time. Uh, if you're new here, we have uh, an insert in the program. If you have questions, or if you want to find out more about New Life, or, or you have a prayer request, sign that. And then when we pa pass the offering bag later on, you can, you can throw that in. Good to have you with us. Um, that was Josh Dew, a church planting resident who's going to be planting in Baltimore, Maryland. Now, some of you are saying, what is a church planting resident? That's what we're going to talk about today, church planting. New Life Christian Church is a church planting church. You can't come here very long without hearing that line at some point. But my guess is if we were to ask, if somebody were to ask most of us, what's it mean that we're a church planting church? They're probably, a large percentage probably, well, I'm not quite sure. We help churches get started. I'm not quite sure what that means. Or if we were to ask, why are you, why does it matter? And, and how much do you own church planting at New Life? That m most would probably say, oh, again, I'm not quite sure. I, I don't really, it's something we do as a church. It's not something that I necessarily have a lot of individual ownership of. Here's the goal today. I want for you to get a vision for church planting. I want for you to leave this place with a sense of godly calling, a sense of enthusiasm, godly vision for starting new churches. I want you to understand why, and I want you to own it. My goal is that you'll walk out of here with a sense of, I am making a difference through church planting. Um, what we're going to do today is give you an experience in church planting. Um, we are, uh, part of what we do as a church is the first 12% of our income goes to church planting, okay? And now the question becomes, why? Why is that a priority? And it begins, in a sense, with this box. 
when I was new in ministry, this box arrived at our offices. And I thought it was really weird. Why in the world is there a box to me from Southeast Christian Church, Louisville, Kentucky, from Bob Russell? And then I looked inside and I discovered it's actually a box of sermons written by my great-grandfather, Lee. Now, I never met Grandpa Lee. He died in September of 1964. I was born in December of 1964, and he was the only other preacher in the family. My grandmother, his daughter, gave these sermons to Bob Russell and when, when he was new in ministry. And so when I started ministry, Bob sent them to me. Apparently, he'd gotten all of them. He felt bad throwing them away or something, so he decided to send them to me. But I tell you the impact that this had. I don't know Grandpa Lee really at all. But I tell you, as I was looking through this, my, my one thought was here is, in a sense, the summary of somebody's ministry. And I thought, what's it going to be like if maybe someday I have some grandchild or great-grandchild that has never met me, and they look at the summation of my life, of my ministry, what are they going to think looking at my sermons? Are they going to say, man, sure I'm proud of that Grandpa Brett. He did his best. He really reached as many people as he could for the sake of the kingdom. Or are they going to look at the box of my life and say, what a disappointment. Why didn't he do more? He really could have had a greater impact. Hey, what a, kind of almost embarrassed that he didn't do better. And I thought, again, looking at this box, it's kind of like, okay, Lord, how can I, at the, by the end of my ministry, have a sense of peace that I've done the best that I can? About that time, I ran, off, ran across a quote of a professor at Fuller's Theological Seminary, Peter Wagner, and the, quotes, the direct quote, actual quote, is going to be on the screen, but he essentially said, there is no more effective means of reaching lost people today than starting new churches. Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. Jesus said, you want to make an impact for my kingdom according to my way, then you go make disciples. And Peter Wagner says, in our generation, there's no more effective means of doing that than by starting new churches. And then it occurred to me what the Apostle Paul said his vision was for ministry. His sense of his, his strategy, according to Romans 15, uh, 20, he, he says there that his strategy was to preach the gospel where Christ has not been named, lest he build on somebody else's foundation. There are a couple of ways that you can do ministry. One is you go to places where other people have built already, and that's not a bad thing. We need people who are able to do that. But in the combination of all these things, it's like maybe God's calling is for us, for me to be a part of planting churches that start churches, not building on somebody else's foundation but building where foundations haven't been built before. So when New Life got started, before we were, it even started, it really had our first opening day. We met as a group in, a, in, in Thatcher and Karen Ferguson's basement. There were about six or eight of us. And, and we said, we believe that if it is God's leading that we are not planting a church. And that if God so blesses, this is the first church of many that he's wanting to start through us. We can't control that, but that's the desire that we have should God bless. And that's why we're a church planting church. And that's why this morning I want you to experience what it's like to be part of a church plant for the first Sunday. My, my guess is that most of you have never been part of a first Sunday at a church. But what we're going to do today is for, for the last 10 months, we've had these church planting residents. Part of what we do with the 12% that we give to church planting is that we um, finance uh, church planting residencies. So guys can come, and for 10 months, these fellows have been reading. They have been taking seminars. We have been bringing in some leading church planting experts who have taught. They have been working on projects. They have been writing sermon series and sermons. They have been developing strategic plans. You know, sometimes we say, you ever pray, Lord, use me despite myself? Um, we also believe that God can use us because we cooperate with them. And we've been, these fellows have been working for the last 10 months to prepare so that they can launch in a couple of months strong, prepared. And today I thought, you know what would be cool? Today is kind of their graduation time. And I thought what would be really cool is for them to share a snippet of their opening day sermon. Many of you have never heard an opening day sermon for a church. I want for you to imagine as you're listening, imagine you're sitting in these churches. Imagine there are hundreds of people in these churches, that have, many of whom have never gone to church before or it's been a long time since they've come to a church worship service. And they're hearing the gospel preached for the first time. I want for you to imagine what it's like to be in their churches as they're preaching this first Sunday morning message. And then I want for you to pray to God 
yourself and say, okay, Lord, what are you calling me to do to take ownership to be a part of helping churches like this get started more and better? So we're going to go in this order. First of all, Joel Pazmino. Many of you know Joel because he's been preaching with us. He's been with us for the last 10 months. We, I, every time I think of Joel, I think to know Joel is to love Joel. It, uh, he's a wonderful guy. He's going to be planning a church in D.C. Following Joel is going to be Roger Burns. Roger is planting in Jacksonville, North Carolina. Last service I misspoke and said Jacksonville, South Carolina. Um, I mean, that was kind of embarrassing. But anyway, so, and, and he was clear to correct me. The, um, and so we're, um, anyway, but we're gracious. The, um, anyway, so Roger's going to speak next. And then, um, and then Josh Dew who you heard a few moments ago, who's planting in Baltimore, Maryland. Now, when you think about Baltimore, Maryland, when I think, I think of Mike Fuster, our campus pastor here. And when I think of Mike Fuster, I think Baltimore, Maryland needs Jesus. If Balt, you know. <laughs> so those three are going to speak for us. And uh, right now, Joel Pazmina, would you bring him on with some honor, please? Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the very first Sunday of this brand new church in Columbia Heights, Washington, D.C. We are so thrilled that you are joining us this morning. And I just want you to know, uh, I don't know how you got here. Maybe somebody invited you to come over. Maybe you got one of our postcards that you got in the mail or you've seen our teachers in the community in the different events we've been doing during the summer. Maybe you were just walking down the street and you saw the rowdy people outside and the signs and wanted to check it out. Whatever the reason is, I want you to know uh, you're in the right place this morning. There's a reason for you to be here and we're so glad that you are joining us. So as we get started, uh, what I want to do this morning is try to answer the question, why exactly should we start a new church? When I grew up, I didn't know that you could start new churches. I thought that they were just there since forever, I guess, or at least from my parents' time or grandparents' time. I didn't know you could just up and start a new church, and, and we're coming into this neighborhood, we're doing this thing, and maybe you're wondering, that why, why would anybody start a new church? So uh, if, if you have a Bible, I would like to invite you to open it in the book of Luke, chapter 15. If not, you can uh, follow along on the screen. Um, and I just start reading. Now, uh, the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, These men receive sinners and eat with them. So he told them this parable, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he had lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me. For I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Jesus is having dinner with some of his friends, and the religious elite of the time don't like it. They're like, you're probably hanging out with the wrong crowd. Why are you having dinner with them? And Jesus goes into this story about a man that owns a sheep and loses a sheep, which is a little bizarre if you ask me. But uh, it, back at those days, uh, sheep were very valuable property. So he's making an example to understand. He said, like, if you had 100 sheep and you lost one, you have 99 sheep. That's a lot of sheep, but you still want that sheep. So you will go out and do anything you can to get that sheep. And then he flips the conversation and he says, no, I'm having dinner with these people, with my friends over here. Because they are valuable to me in the same way that that lost sheep was valuable to the owner of the sheep. What he's saying is, you see, humanity has gone away from God to a certain degree. But God values humanity so much. And, and for, for some reason, the love of God is such that he doesn't want to lose his relationship with humanity. So he sends his son into the world to bring people back to him because people matter to God. In, in one of in a passage later on in, in Luke, Jesus says, the Son of Man, and he's talking about himself, came into the world to seek and save the lost. Now, the lost, that word, it, it might sound a little bit, I don't know, 
aggressive, like, like you're lost and, and we're found, like, you know, what, what's going on? But in the context of this story, Jesus is saying, no, no, lost actually means for God, valuable. You ever hear the term, like, we want to reach lost people? It's, it's not a derogatory thing. It's we want to reach people that matter to God. You, you know how much we matter to God? Well, Jesus says, if you lose a sheep, you, you will do everything you can to get it back because it's valuable to you. You would spare no expense. You would spare no effort to get it back. In the life of Jesus, sparing no expense and sparing no effort means coming into the world. The Son of God steps into human history. Uh, in the opening lines of the Gospel of John, one translation says, The Word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. And in an urban context here in Northwest D.C., I like to think that Jesus rented a basement apartment next door to me and moved in. And it's small, and, you know, he has to pay high rent and, you know, has to deal with the rats in the city and whatever. But he doesn't care because God loves me so that he wants to live on my block. So the Son of God steps into the world. But it doesn't end there. The, the, the expense, the effort that, 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 that it takes to get people back ends leading Jesus to laying down his life on a cross to pay for our sin so that humanity can be reconciled with God. And ultimately, that is why we are starting a new church. You see, right after Jesus died and came back from the dead, uh, before he ascended back to heaven, he just sent his disciples into the world. And he says, you see how much people matter to me? That I'm willing to come into the world and lay down my life. Well, now I want you to tell them this story. And I want you to tell them that I have provided a way for them to come back to God. And he sends his disciples and they go all over the world to whatever country, to whatever city, to whatever neighborhood would open the doors to them. They would go there. And what would they do? They started new churches. They go to a town. They they, they find a group group of people. They start meeting. And they start new churches so that people that were far from God would come near to him. And that's why we're here. We're just following on that tradition that for 2,000 years has happened. And a couple of years ago, my wife and I, we just felt this draw, this call to Washington, D.C. and to the neighborhood of Columbia Heights. If you look statistically, this is probably one of the most populated neighborhoods in the city. It's definitely the most diverse neighborhood in the city. It's there's tens of thousands of people in a very, you know, short square mileage. And what I find fascinating about the story of the sheep is that Jesus doesn't only care about, like, the many sheep. He cares about the one. You know what that means? That means that if everybody in the world knew God, but you didn't, Jesus would, just, would still say, it's worth it for me to come down into the world and lay down my life for you. That's why we're starting this new church, because it's only that people matter to God, but you matter to God. A few years ago, I was walking into a Starbucks one morning, and I saw this sign. I think we can have it on the screen. I just read it to you. Colin, it was great to see you Thursday. We're sorry it was for such a short time, but the door is always open for you. Come home. Shower, eat, visit, whatever you need. No expectations. We love you always, Dad and Karen. I have no idea who these people are. I have no idea who Colin is, but that sign has stuck with me, and I keep it on my phone, and every once in a while I take a look at it. And I think that the work of the church is a lot like that sign. Because you see, God wants his children to come back to him. And in every new church, in every new neighborhood in the city, in every new neighborhood, everywhere in the world, is this, this sign from God saying, you can come back home. So this is our commitment to you this morning. For as long as God has us and for as long as we have strength, we're going to be here every Sunday morning. We're going to set up and we're going to create an environment where you have the opportunity to have an encounter With the love of God. That's our mission statement. We exist to create environments where people can have encounters with God. 
Because the Father loves you. And he wants you to come home. Because you're valuable to him. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your love that pursues us over everything else. That doesn't give up and keeps coming for us. We thank you for all the things that you're going to do in this new church. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. (laughs) Relentless. You know the feeling. It's this overwhelming sensation that you just can't get away from something. Uh, It's this thing that, that burdens you. You can't escape it. You can't get away from it. You can't run from it. You can't hide from it. It's always there. And now is not a good time to look at your spouse and give them the nudge. So I've been married for, uh, for seven years, and it's really fun to talk about how my wife and I met, because here's the thing, uh, when we met, Aaron didn't like me at all. <laughs> and to make a really long story short, uh, I had to relentlessly and probably annoyingly, if that's a word, I just made it up, it's not a word it is now, uh, pursue her, I mean relentlessly. Apparently I wasn't as funny and as wise and as good looking as as I am now, Um, because she's, I hope she's in love with me after seven years. Uh, Guys, uh, this isn't what the sermon's about, but if you want to continue to develop your marriage, don't stop pursuing your wife. My pursuit of her was relentless. And you guys, you guys know about the things in your life that are relentless, don't you? Uh, your, your bills. That would have been a good time to say amen. Uh, your kids, even better time, I, I think. Work. Your in-laws, don't say amen to that one. Uh, maybe they're relentless. But think, um, think about these things. What if in your life these, these things are relentless? And for some of you, your imagination doesn't have to go very far. What if it were shame? Your past or your current sins? Man, it, it took a lot for you to come to church today. It took a lot for you to, get, to even get out of bed because of your shame, let alone to come to a brand new church where you don't know anyone. And it might even be weird, but, but you're here And shame is this unrelenting reality for you. Maybe it's disgust. Maybe you're disgusted with with what you've done in your life or what you've done with your life or or perhaps even what you did, did last night. What if disgust was an unrelenting reality for you? What about humiliation? What if someone has done something to you or something has happened to you that's outside of your control? And so humiliation, what about guilt? What if that is an unrelenting reality for you? You're guilty about how your life has turned out the w- and, it, and it hasn't turned out the way you thought it, it would or how someone else thinks that it should have turned out. And so guilt is this unrelenting reality for you or maybe it's fear, fear of what's coming next, or fear that the past is going to catch up with you. Sin is relentless. And Satan is relentless. Man, y'all, I don't know about y'all, but, but, but he's relentless in my life. Maybe it's just me this morning. But if it's also you too, I'm, I'm really glad that you're here. I, I want to read a story from John chapter 8. And so if you have your Bibles, you can read on John, John, in John chapter 8. It'll also be on the screen. It, it says this. Then each of them went to his own home, and Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees, they brought in a woman that had been caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group. And then they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. And the law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing Jesus. Now, make sure you notice the reason that they're bringing this woman to Jesus. It's not so they can carry out justice or carry out the law of Moses or to glorify God in any way. 
Their reason for bringing this woman to Jesus is to trick Jesus. If they can trick Jesus, if they can, if they can show that he's committed blasphemy, then they can arrest Jesus, and if they arrest Jesus, then they can kill Jesus. But for a second, Again, imagine what the woman is feeling. And for some of us, our imagination, again, doesn't have to go very far. Shame, humiliation, disgust, guilt, embarrassment, fear. If Jesus goes along with the views of of this religious group, she knows exactly what could happen. She knows that the men that are standing there holding these huge stones are going to hurl, hurl them at her until she stops breathing. Now imagine again everyone that's sitting there. They're waiting to hear what Jesus is going to say. They're sitting on the edge of their, of their rocks or their, their seats. They're anticipating the words of Jesus. Maybe they're thinking Jesus is going to say something like, where's my rock? I, I love God. I'm the son of God. And you guys didn't bring me a rock so I can participate What if he says something like, man, this is what God wants. Let's embarrass her first, and then let's kill her. Well, she did sin, so uh, consequences, she must die. You know, we would probably be glorifying God, actually, if we kill this woman. And this might even be your image of church. This might be what you think about when you think church. Maybe even you have been mistreated by that way in the past by a church. Maybe you see church as a place of condemnation, of hate, of ridicule, of embarrassment, of fear. Not here. Not at this church. Not at Restore. We want to live and we want to love the same way that Jesus does. So, so let's look back at the story and see exactly what Jesus does. Picking up at the second part of chapter 8, verse 6, it says, But Jesus bent down, and he started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up, and he said to them, If any of you is without sin, let that person be the first to throw a stone at her. And again, he stooped down, and he wrote on the ground. At this, those who, uh, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first, uh, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up, and he asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir. Neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Now go and leave your life of sin. One by one, first the older ones, then the younger ones, they all walk away, realizing that they don't have a rock to hold in front of Jesus. And who's left? The sinner and the Savior. And Jesus sends her away free, free from her sin, living a new life that's apart from sin. He says, go and live a a new life, a brand new life apart from your sin. Go. He sends her away restored. And this describes who we are as a church. At Restore, we are a group of broken people who are pursuing a perfect Jesus together. And this is how we want to do it. We want to love God relentlessly. Because after all, he has relentlessly loved us. And we want to love people recklessly. We will put our bodies on the line to love people. Because after all, Jesus put his body on the line to love us. And we want to love this world radically beyond reason, with international giving, uh, international missions, and through church planting. We at Restore, we love because he first loved us, relentlessly, recklessly, and radically. Relentless, reckless, radical. That's who we are. We are Restore. God, I thank you for your love. Your relentless love, your, your radical love, your reckless love. God, I thank you for, for your love for, for sinners like, like us. And God, that you made a way to call us back to you. God, I thank you for your church and for the love that it has shown to all of us. Um, but ultimately, God, I thank you for Jesus, his death, burial, and the power of the resurrection. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Hey, good morning, everybody. Y'all good? We good? All right. So welcome to Momentum. I'm really glad that you're here. You came to the right spot. So it, it doesn't matter where you're from or, or, or what you did this morning. It doesn't matter if you were down on Baltimore Street yesterday, either side of the street. It doesn't matter if you live in a high rise or you already got high this morning. You're here now and you're in the right place. It doesn't matter if you got bands on it or you're too poor to pay attention. Here, we're equal. Men, women, children, rich, poor, equal. First, I want to let you know a little bit about who I am and what I do here at Momentum. My name is Josh Dew. If we've never met, hello. Um, I'm married to my wonderful wife, Meredith. We have three kids. Uh, we've been married for about eight years. And Joshua, Juliet, and Jade. Yeah, we're all Jays. And uh, we're really glad that you're here today. You picked a great, a great place to come today. Here at Momentum, uh, my job is to teach and to preach and to help you become disciples or followers of Jesus. And together, we make up the church. Now, I'm going to tell you right now that Momentum is a church that's different. I'll tell you why. Here, we're going to keep it true. We're going to keep it honest. We're going to keep it 100. Say 100. Okay. Not 100. Let's try again. Say 100. Come on, you can do it. Say 100. All right, there we go. So, uh, now we got that out of the way. We're going to be the church who God wants us to be. Now, they ain't nothing new about it. The church has been around for a really long time, and today we're going to kind of learn a little bit about it. It doesn't matter what your past church experience was. It doesn't matter what your grandmama say. It doesn't matter any of that. Here, we're going to be the church that God wants us to be. We're going to keep it 100 and stick to the Bible. Say 100. All right, so book of Acts. Grab a Bible. Uh, You can find one around on your chairs. You can follow along on the screen. We're going to be in Acts chapter 2. And we're going to look at what the first church did, what, what, what was going on there in that situation. Now, we're in Acts, not like you're about to chop something, but here we go. Acts chapter 2. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. All right, here we go. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved." So there it is. There's the first church getting started, people deciding to change their lives, change who they are, and follow what God says. That's it. That's how it works. Now, uh, keep in mind, this doesn't necessarily change your current circumstances. It certainly doesn't make your kids start acting right, but this is how it works. This is how it gets started. So let's focus on this for a minute. What is the church? Or better yet, what is the church supposed to be? To explain this and and other concepts, I'm going to do research mostly from the Bible because I believe that it has the ultimate authority on life and truth. But we're also going to look at other people, other books, other resources to kind of help explain some of these things. Now, I'll give you the list of resources if you want. You can pick that up and you can go back and learn for yourself and kind of dig in and fact check if that's something you want to do. Other things that I'll, I'll mention will either be learned through my life or through Bible college or seminary. But let's focus right now on what exactly is the church. What is it supposed to be? Many sources say that the church is supposed to be what we see right here in Acts chapter 2. I'll read it again in a paraphrase. They committed themselves to the teaching of the apostles, the life together, the common meal, and the prayers. Everyone around was in awe. All those wonders and signs done through the apostles. And all the believers lived in wonderful harmony, holding everything in common. They sold whatever they owned and pooled their resources so that each person's need was met. 
They followed a daily discipline of worship in the temple, followed by meals at home. Every meal a celebration, exuberant and joyful as they praised God. People in general liked what they saw, and every day their numbers grew as God added to those who were being saved. See, the Bible also says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that the followers of Jesus were called His body. So what, what does all this mean? Well, I think it means that those who were followers of Jesus make up a group, a, a body, a church that is supposed to go and do and be who Jesus was and what Jesus did. And not only that, but they followed the teachings of the apostles. And that's what we're going to do, and that's what we're going to teach here at Momentum. See, the church shared their resources. We saw that first. They shared their resources and lived in common so nobody had need. And I'm not going to lie, uh, this part is often a bit challenging for us to figure out, this sharing idea. See, in kindergarten, they taught us to share, but then as we grew, we learned that it comes kind of, it's harder and harder to do. So we're going to sort that out, and we're going to be generous givers to each other with whatever it is that God has blessed us with. Time, talents, treasures, stints, smarts, savings, pace, power, purse, however you want to say it, we're going to be generous with the things that God has given us. It's, it's not about guilt. It's not about obligation. It's about something that we get to do for each other, being followers of Jesus. Next, we see they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And specifically, in our case, that's the Bible. That's where we're going to find the apostles' teaching. We believe that the Bible is true. We believe that the Bible is right. And we believe that the Bible is God's Word, 100 we believe that the Bible is God's story of God's mission to reconnect with God's creation. This began with Adam and Eve, and it, and it continued through God's provision with the people, the Israelites, and completed with Jesus and is now profitable for us and teaching us how to live, 100. Now, the church is supposed to be about this, this shared life together eating together. And that's what this place is for. This is, that's why we built this place here. You and your friends can come during the week and share life, share food, share stories, share experiences. And I ain't gonna lie, it's, it's difficult sometimes to find some place that we think is safe to do these things together. So this here can be your safe space, 100. The church is supposed to be about prayer. We're gonna do that too. We're going to pray through music. We're going to pray through song. We're even going to pray through silence because we believe that God loves us and wants to stay in constant communication with us. And prayer paves that road. See, when you, when you boil it down, the church isn't so much about the place. It's more about the people. It's not about getting all dressed up. We're not going to do that. It ain't about fronting. We're not going to play that. We're going to keep it 100 and you bring the real you to the table. That's what we're going to be about. And last but certainly not least, the church is about exuberant and joyful praise to God. We're going to do that too. We're going to sing. We're going to dance. We're going to have a good time because we believe that God wants us in a relationship of celebration. We believe God is worth it. Thank you so much for being with us today. Let's pray. God. You have blessed us immeasurably beyond all that we can ask or think. And we know that these blessings come from the life and sacrifice and resurrection of Jesus. God, we thank you for that gift. Now, God, as we attempt to grow and be the church that you want us to be, we ask that you would help us to share in this community with other people. Help us to continually grow into the image of Jesus and take that message of his love and his salvation and spread it wherever we go. God, help us to live in unity and help us to grow in our love for you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. It's always humbling to have to do this for some reason. Um, do you understand why I would say in 200 years from now, if you were to be able to come back and examine how new life has had <clears throat> its, her greatest influence for the kingdom, for eternity, for the world, it's going to be through church planting. In 200 years fr from now, should Jesus <clears throat> not have returned, <clears throat> people are not going to say, new life Christian church really made a difference because Brett preached. 
I wish they would, but I don't think they will. I wish they would have really made a difference because they're so creative. No, I think in 200 years from now, our greatest impact will be because we helped churches that started new churches. It'll be because of men like Joel and Roger and Josh and others that we have sent and will continue to send. And my question for you is, don't you want to be a part of that? That long after your life is over, you are still able to make a difference for the kingdom because of how you invested your life while you were here. So what are your next steps? What are possibilities for you? Very doable things. First of all, pray. God builds the church. The church is built by prayer, by praying, God, provide for the, uh, us, the people. God, you provide the opportunities. God, you show us the way. You build the church in the way that you get the glory. And that is why one of the best things you could do is today, when this service is over, go back to the Passion for Planting table and sign up to be on the prayer teams for these guys. Wouldn't it be a great thing? Would it be an amazing blessing if 1,500 people today would sign up to pray for these churches to get started and God would come in power because you all are praying? You can do that. That's not a big deal. For you. They're not going to require great sacrifice. Second thing you can do is give. I've told you the first 12% of our offerings goes to church planting. And the result of that has been a number of things. Some has been through, you know, we've been primary support, significant supporters of over 100 church plants. We um, give smaller support for uh, other church planting ventures. We give to supporting um, Exponential and, and, and Dale's salary. A whole number of things that happen. When you give, you make a difference in starting new churches. So if you give, you continue to give. If you're not tithing, you're going to spend your money in some way this week, and some of it is going to perish for eternity, but some will continue for eternity. And what you give for church planting is going to make a difference in this life after you've lived as well as for all eternity. Give. Third thing that I would say is serve. Whenever we start a church in this area, we always send people to help them. Dale Spalding will put together a team of people who will just go for a Sunday morning or two. You know, most of these new churches don't have a lot of people to serve, and, and most people need to be learning. And so we send people who will go, and you can just greet and welcome people who are coming to church for the first time. Or, or, um, or maybe you hold babies in the nursery, or maybe you uh, teach a Sunday school class, or help in worship or something. And so you can go in the back today and sign up and say, I'm willing to serve. Now that doesn't mean you're absolutely committed to a certain time. It just means when the time comes, Dale can contact you, and if you're available and can do it, you're, you are, and that's great. When Joel starts in, in, uh, in D.C. this fall, He's going to need some people to help support him. And you can be a part of that, and that makes a difference. I can tell you, it was really frustrating when New Life got started, quite frankly, and I reached out to churches in the Washington, D.C. area, say, could you help, could you just help in the nursery so we could have people leave their kids in, in our nursery and know it's safe and they can go to worship, and nobody helped. And so we said, we don't want it, that to happen anymore. We want to help. We want to serve. You can serve. Fourth is... Um, no, I'm not bitter about it, but it is kind of hurtful, so of it. Uh, okay, fourth thing you can do is experience church planting by being part of Exponential. You know, we're, we Exponential church planting is going to run out of our offices. Todd Wilson, who's on staff with us, uh, we, we uh, support some of his salary th uh, for church planting through that. Um, we've held national conferences for several years, one in Florida, the other in Southern California. This year, we're, we're starting regional conferences. September 12th and 13th, we're having a regional conference here for Exponential. Hundreds of people will be here. You can be a part of it. Others are going to have to pay. You can come for free, okay? But sign up and come be a part of that. Uh, September 12th or 13th, or even better, volunteer. It's going to take a lot of work to put this thing on. And if you would come and be able to help set up on the 12th or tear down on the 13th or somehow support in the middle of that, that would be a huge blessing to others. And the final thing I want to say is let God create in you a vision for church planting. We're going to continue to church plant in the next several years. Well, as long as new life exists, I hope. But in the next 10 years, we're going to plant a church and maybe God is going to call you to be a, part, a core member of that church plant. Maybe we'll start a church as multi-site. And God's going to call you to be a part of that church plant. How is God, maybe some of you are going to become church planters someday. I don't know. But how's God, would you pray that God will plant that seed within you that he's going to continue to develop in years to come? 
By the way, it just occurred to me, one other thing you can do. If you know somebody who lives in Baltimore that needs, that, that needs a church, if you know somebody in D.C. who needs a church, you can talk with them. Maybe God's making that connection through you today being here. Um, or Jacksonville, uh, North Carolina, or South Carolina, wherever Jacksonville might be. So there you have it. But don't you want to make a difference with your life? God is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ever ask or imagine through his power that is at work within us. Don't you want to make a difference with your life? Let me share with you this story, and then we'll wrap up. I just thought about, I thought, oh, you know what? Last night, this just occurred to me this year. Um, I, I hope it's helpful. I was back home this past week, um, Connie Lake, Pennsylvania. One of our neighbors there is uh, Pete Rickard. Those of you who are Orioles fans in the late 60s, early 70s, recognize the name Pete Rickard. He was left-handed reliever for the Orioles. He also pitched for the Senators, later pitched for the, for the Dodgers, um, has a couple World Series rings. And I was just reading in the front yard, and Pete came by and sat down, and we just started talking. For two hours, he, started to, he just start, shared these stories of playing Major League Baseball. And, well, and what he did most of his life, actually, after he got out of Major League Baseball, was he was a pitching coach at the AAA level for the, for the Giants. But um, he just told me story after story about, you know, about going out to dinner with Mickey Mantle and what it was like to play with Boog Powell or, or, or Frank, and, uh, Frank Robinson or Brooks Robinson or you know, the, how was, the best manager he ever had was Earl Weaver. Just all these stories he was talking And fun stories and great stories. And, um, uh, but they often included food and beer. But at any rate, the, um, but then he said, Brett, you know what I find most meaningful? He said, I had a letter recently from a, young man that I coached in California, in AAA level. He said, he said, after this, late in the season, he pitched this game and he pitched great and I, I gave him a hug and I said, you stick with it. You're a big leaguer. He said the next spring training, he went to spring training and he hurt his arm and he never recovered, never made it to the big leagues. But he said he recently got a letter from this former pitcher who said, Pete, he says, this guy now has three children, lives in North Carolina with his, with his family. He says, and he wrote this letter to Pete and just said, Pete, thank you for your encouragement. I want you to know I'm not done with baseball yet. And here's the thing that's impressive about the story. As Pete's telling me that story, he's welling up with tears. I mean, he's not some guy who's always crying. He's starting to cry. He says, Brett, that's what is so meaningful, most meaningful to me in my baseball career is I feel like I've helped somebody. I made a difference in somebody's life. And I thought of that today in the context of church planting. I want to say, don't you want to make a difference in somebody's life? Not just for life today, improving their lives and make it better, but to change their lives for eternity. Help people find salvation in Christ, peace in Christ, eternity, because of the grace of Jesus Christ. You can make a difference. And one of the ways that we do that is by being a church that starts churches. How are you going to own that? I, pl- I just pray you'll take a next step and own that today. Let's pray together, please. Heavenly Father, make us your church. We cannot be your church, Lord, without you. You define it. You make it happen. You provide for us the people. You provide for us. The- Lord, we don't have any vision But you show us what you want us to do. And that's what we desire. Lord, we can't make anything happen except by the power and leadership of your Holy Spirit. Um, Lord, this life is over so fast. And we have so little control. I pray that you would give us your vision. And now help us to take next steps to own the people you would have us to be. The church that you would have us to be for your eternal glory. This is our prayer. This is our desire through Jesus Christ. Amen. Why are we a church planting church? Because the Bible says God so loved the world that he gave, that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We're church planting church because what Joel said at the beginning here when he said if all the world were saved but you didn't know Jesus and you were the only one Jesus would still say, I will give my life for you. And if you come here today and you've never given your life to Jesus, you've never accepted him as Savior, today is the day for you to say, thank you, Jesus, for your love. I want to be in right relationship with God. And so you say, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. I need him to be my Savior, my forgiver, and the leader of my life. 
And then you take that next step to make that commitment concrete in the waters of baptism. You can be baptized today. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, every week we take of communion where we hold on to a cracker and a cup that remind us what it means that Jesus left heaven for earth and gave his life for us. And every commitment that we make, okay, Lord, we want you to use our lives, but we do it in view of the cross because of how you have given your life, first of all, for us. Lord, help us now to give our lives for you and for others in that same way. So if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, I pray this will be a meaningful time to engage with God, holding the cracker, holding the cup, taking when you're ready, and then when we're done, Pat will wrap us up with a moment of prayer. Let's share right now, please. God, thank you for saving us. Thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for loving us. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Good morning. It's good to be up here and not having to run from the other side of the building. Um, we are so glad you're here. Um, as always, thank you for coming. I have just a really couple quick things to mention. First off is the offering. Um, as Brett mentioned uh, earlier, 12% of everything you give um, comes to help support these guys and others across the United States. Um, if you're new here, please know that offering isn't intended to be a time that you know you should get all nervous about or anything like that. Um, nobody's looking over your shoulder. Uh, we just want you to give however you feel led to give today, however God prompts you. And for those of you who are part of New Life, obviously uh, this is kind of a big deal. It's how we um, are able to impact so many churches around the United States, how we're able to um, operate the end zone, how we're able to um, impact our community. So thank you for your generosity. Guys and gals, go ahead and come down forward. Um, I just want to mention very quick uh, three mission trips. Um, first off, the uh, teens got back from the Dominican Republic. As the executive minister who tends to worry about stuff, I'm glad that everyone who went made it home. Yay! Um, they had a great time. Um, yeah, Megan and Dan uh, did a fantastic job leading that trip. Um, they are at our Linton Hall campus. Um, but anyway, 
Um, they had a great time. Um, this Saturday, we have a group. I didn't get the final count. I believe it's about 80 people heading to Williamsburg, Kentucky um, to serve there. Uh, they're able to make a huge impact. Um, please, please, please be praying for them, um, mostly for their conversations that they have with people that they're serving, people in the community. Um, you may have noticed all the books as you came in. That's an opportunity for you to support that trip financially. Um, if any of those books look interesting to you, know that um, all that money is going directly towards that mission trip. Finally, um, Ecuador is coming up this fall. Um, this is your last week to register. If you're interested in going with us to Ecuador to meet your compassion kids or just to serve and love on them, we would love to have you join us. Um, Dale's going to wrap us up and uh, send us out. Day by just taking some time to acknowledge the efforts of these guys. They have worked really, really hard over the past 10 months developing numerous plans and strategies to help them get ready to go plant healthy churches that are going to reach people far from God. So to recognize their efforts, we'd like to give them a certificate of completion for our church planter residency program and a gift, too, to help them in their new role as senior ministers. So join me in, in celebrating these guys. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Woo, that's right. <laughs> yeah. part of quality work like this and quality leadership with, like these guys. And by the way, Dale Spaulding is knocking it out of the park. Dale uh, retired early from Spaulding to come on from Boeing, from, uh, Boeing Our, although it would have been cool nice. Work yeah. Spaulding. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's baseball. But anyway, um, to, and, to, to do, and I just wonder who's the next Dale Spaulding too, by the way. So let's pray for God's blessing on these churches to be planted. Heavenly Father, we... Um, Acknowledge that you are God, that you have made us, that you have placed us in this time and space for your purposes, for your glory, and we want to live full out for your purposes and your honor. We thank you for these men and their obedience to your calling, and we pray that you would go before them in all that they do in planting, that you would, again, prepare the soil ahead that you would send people before they even know they need the people, that you would send, help them to connect with lost people who, um, if it weren't for their churches, they might not even connect with you, but you are sending them to reach them. Pray that you would send leaders, pillar people, who will be with them for the next 25 years of ministry. People, they're not even, not even smart enough to be able to identify themselves, but you have identified them, and they will love these leaders, and they will love these churches and love you and say, we will do whatever, we are here whatever for your glory. Um, God, may your power be known, may it be seen, may your glory be known because of the way that you provide, the way that you build these churches. And Lord, um, when these guys get knocked down and they feel beaten up by the work that they're doing, we ask that you would restore their soul. Um, God, we thank you we thank you that you love us so much that you allow us, to be, allow us to be a part of your great purposes. Now help us to live up to the honor. It's through Christ we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Thanks for coming. Sign up to be on the prayer list for these groups.